What's up guys, my name is Julian and today I'm gonna be answering the question of which battery is best. Now, we can get into all of the specs and compare which one is best on a technical level, but most people are actually way more confused about the more basic concepts of what a battery does and if you even need it, and the multiple different aspects in terms of sizing, and there's just so much more than just comparing some of these specs. And I'm gonna get into this in a few minutes, but first, we're gonna be answering these questions right here. So, so first we need to talk about the answers to these questions because unless you actually understand the answers to all of these questions, uh, comparing batteries, you're, it's, it's too soon to do that. You still need to understand just some fundamentals. So the first thing is, do you even need a battery at all? Now, batteries a few years ago weren't really being talked about that much because pretty much most of the United States had really, really great net metering agreements. Now, what a net metering agreement is, is your relationship with the utility company and how much they buy back the power for that you send back. Now, it used to be in California, for example, that no one needed a battery, and that was because you were getting full retail value, but many parts of the country still offer a one-to-one -one net metering. So, you know, if you're talking to like Sunrun or something, for example, they're required to put a battery with every single system, which is completely bogus. Like, just the other day, I was talking to someone in LADWP territory, which is the utility company in, in Los Angeles, which has a really great net metering agreement still because they're not controlled by the CPUC, which is, you know, SoCal Edison, PG&E, and San Diego Gas and Electric, for example. And you don't need a battery at all to save money. There are a ton of other smaller utilities in California that are not controlled by the CPUC and offer great net metering. I'm working with a couple of clients right now with in Pasadena and Glendale, for example, and they have great net metering. And so they were getting pitched batteries and I had to explain to them that, no, you don't even need to make that investment. So the first thing that you need to know is your utility company's net metering deal. And there's, like I said, lots of places in the United States that still offer a one-to-one. -one. I mean, if you're like in New York, Maryland, Illinois, uh, multiple other northeastern states and lots of other places around the country, you don't need a battery at all. You're just gonna send back the power in the daytime, receive full value retail credits, and then just draw power from the grid at night and it's all gonna cancel out. Now, if you are in a place that doesn't have great net metering, like for example, if you're in Southern California or anywhere in Edison PG&E territory, along with potentially multiple other places around the United States, now a battery is required because you will only really be able to knock out a certain percentage of your bill because you'll be sending power back to the utility in the middle of the day and not really receiving any type of valuable credit for it. And then when that is applied against your nighttime usage, it just doesn't really add up to anything substantial against it. And so you would be left ultimately with two bills kind of in a way. I mean, your daytime usage will mostly be from the solar and you'll be less dependent upon the grid in the daytime, but maybe that's like only a third or a half of your bill that you would be getting rid of. And in fact, in California, if you are in SDG&E, SoCal Edison, or PG&E, you can literally only get about half of your bill at the very best covered if you don't have a battery. So if you are getting pitched a system without a battery, and like I said, you're in one of those three main utilities, you need to run away because the person is either not understanding how net metering works, or they're just trying to pull a quick one on you and get a sale to make their commission real fast. And this, this is obviously bogus. I've seen a lot of these proposals in the last six months where basically the salesperson is straight up just lying to their, their customer saying, no, 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 you don't need a battery. And I, it's like, I have to come and explain this stuff. And it, it, it's making it very frustrating for us honest solar consultants that are actually trying to help. So that's the first reason why you would even need a battery. It has to do with the net metering agreement. Now, the second reason why you may want a battery is for backup power in case of grid failures. Even if you are in a place with really good net metering, but you're constantly dealing with blackouts and you're looking for a solution to not be losing power all the time, now a battery is going to come into play and make sense for you as a possible solution, um, a, a generator being another potential solution. Now, if you have really great net metering and you don't really need the battery, a generator may end up being a better solution for you, but if you equally don't have good net metering and you're dealing with blackouts, a battery is going to solve both problems at once and that is the route you're going to want to go. 
So now number two, how many batteries do you really even need? Now this also uh, needs to be divided up into two categories. The, the first category is those, like I said, without good net metering. And the simple answer is if you take the kilowatt size of the system, let's say for example, you're, you're installing a 10 kilowatt system, you're going to need at the very, very least 15 kilowatt hours of battery storage upwards of even 25. So it's about 1.5 to 2.5 times the ratio. Anything less than that, and you're still going to be reliant on the grid for a good portion of your electricity. Now, if you're installing batteries for backup purposes, now it's about making sure you have enough solar power to fill your batteries and then calculating all of the components that you want to run off that battery in the event of a blackout. And now it's a matter of how long you, you want to run those components. And so you need to do a calculation and a good solar consultant will in detail go through all of the individual breakers and items that you want backed up and figure out how long the battery can sustain those items. Okay, the third question is, can I go off grid now that I have batteries? And the simple answer is, no, you're not gonna ultimately go off grid. If your property already has existing electrical service, there's pretty much close to a 0% chance that you will be able to disconnect from the grid. Like in California, for example, you're not gonna disconnect from the grid. It's literally like against the law. Now, you of course can put your solar and batteries into an off-grid mode per se and not be reliant on the grid if possible. But something important to understand is that even when we're sizing solar and batteries now, and it's supposed to be, you know, like something that covers 90% of your electric bill, there is still a certain percentage of power that will be coming from the grid, especially in winter time when the days are much shorter and the batteries are maybe not getting as fully charged and having to kick on earlier in the evening because nighttime is literally longer during the winter time. And so it could be that like at two or three in the morning, your batteries in the winter time will be running out and you'll go back to grid power versus in the summer where maybe those batteries aren't needing to kick on until like six to eight o'clock and you, you have have more power in them as well and so ultimately you, it's going to get you through through the night okay number four is will the battery work if the grid blacks out and this is one of the biggest misconceptions in solar because there's actually two ways to set yourself up with batteries we call the first way just self-consumption batteries, which is only solving the problem of the net metering not being favorable. And so you can store your excess power in the daytime and then use that power in the evening time and at nighttime. But in this scenario, if the grid blacks out, you will also have a system that completely turns off and you, you will not have backup power in, in that event. In order to have backup, you need a critical loads panel and a transfer switch because you need to disconnect from the grid so you're not feeding power back into the grid because it could be that like a lineman is working on the lines jet down the street and you can't be feeding power into it. It's called dirty power. Um, so this is a big no-no and it's part of the national electric code. And so in order to solve that, you need a transfer switch which disconnects you from the grid. Now, in California, most people, in my opinion, uh, they're not too gung-ho on this backup battery because right now it costs like about five to six thousand extra dollars to set yourself up with backup versus just self-consumption and i'm recommending people unless it's super super important to have backup in the immediate to wait because there is a technology coming out called a meter caller which is going to replace the need to put a whole critical loads panel in and rewire all the breakers over into it and it's going to save about five $5,000 or $4,000 on average for an installation. It's gonna be quicker, easier, and be and cheaper. So you can retrofit, retrofit this technology in, uh, in like six months or a year or whenever it's completely ready for market. Uh, Enphase, Tesla, and Franklin are three that are coming out with their meter callers. And so I'm suggesting people just get their solar and battery installed right now. And then if they feel like in a, a few months or in a, in a year that you know maybe they are experiencing bl grid blackouts, they can add that meter caller in later and have the full backup capability for much cheaper. I don't know the exact pricing at this point in time, but I have a feeling it's gonna be like less than $2,000, maybe closer to a thousand, uh, depending upon permits and you know fixed costs by the utility and things like that. Um, it, there's still some unknown, but it's gonna be multiple thousand dollars less. All right, and the fifth question is, what is the best backup battery? Tesla? Well, 
Not really, in my opinion. Tesla is, uh, th there's some flaws with it, and I'll go into that here in a few minutes when we look at the other board with all the specs on it, but this is more going to depend upon your solar system and inverter and what you are really trying to get out of the battery. Just because Tesla has a sexy you know, brand name doesn't mean it's the best. To be honest with you, uh, some of their technology is actually kind of behind uh, the curve compared to some of the other brands. And the sixth question is, what are the most important specs to look for in a battery? So you're gonna be looking for a few things. You're gonna be looking for the kilowatt hour capacity. This is like how many gallons of gasoline or how many units of energy you can store. Kilowatt is going to be the power output. So some people like to think of this as like the horsepower. I like to think of it as, you know, how fast if you had like a water jug with 10 gallons you know, that the 10 gallons is the kilowatt hours, but the kilowatt is how fast you could drain the water, you know, out of the nozzle. Uh, and so you need to have obviously enough kilowatt hours to get you through as long as you want the batteries to work for, but you also need enough power in order to supply what the components you are needing to be powered with uh, because they're, they're gonna be requiring a certain demand. And if you don't have enough power, you won't even be able to f use some of these things that you're thinking may work in the event of a blackout or just in general. One of the main things that people run into here is they think that one battery is going to work and basically um, they can use an AC. And that is, that is not true. Most AC systems have what's called an LRA or a locked rotor amperage, which far exceeds what one battery can power. And so the AC won't, wouldn't even be able to be turned on with just like one battery. So if we're talking about like more full home backup, two batteries at the very least is where you're gonna want to start. All right, so now let's get into the battery comparison. If you like this video and find it helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. And please reach out to me directly because I have 30 states currently covered that I can help you go solar and you can avoid the nonsense of working with a lot of the jokers in this industry. We'll get straight to the point and give you real honest advice and try to help you out. About 40 to 50% of people that reach out end up actually going solar with us. And I really have pride in the fact that we have such high ratios of actually bringing people to the fruition of actually having their solar installed versus just kind of wasting their time and giving them a sales pitch. So let's talk about these batteries. Now, there's a lot of batteries on here and I'm gonna first talk about some of the specs up top and, and kind of how they're important. And then I'm gonna kind of talk about the scenarios in which you may wanna use some of these batteries and the differences. Okay, so the first one is capacity. So like I just said a few seconds ago, this is gonna be in kilowatt hours. And this is gonna be, like I said, like how many gallons the tank can hold. It's like how many units of energy the, the battery can hold. And so, these are all going to be a little bit different, but the gist of it is that most of these batteries are stackable. And so really you can kind of have, for the most part, however many kilowatt hours you need with almost any battery. So just because like, you know, the Enphase 5P is only five kilowatt hours and you know, let's say the Tesla is 13.5, it doesn't mean that the Tesla is better. It just means that it's a different size and you can easily put three 5Ps together to have 15 kilowatt hours of capacity. Now, a more important and better way to look at this is more the relationship and the ratio of the kilowatt hour and the power or the kilowatt rating. And so this is, for example, where the 5P battery by Enphase is clearly the winner because each five kilowatt hour uh, unit puts out 3.84 continuous and up to 7.68 surge. And so if you have three five Ps together, now you have over 11 kilowatts of power output, which is going to be pretty much better than almost anything else on the board. Now, like I said, still with most of these batteries, you can stack them, but you know, you may need to get a whole nother um, inverter or stack of batteries to get a second inverter. And that may cost more money to actually get uh, enough power output for what you're looking for. Now, most houses will probably, probably be okay with working with, you know, the existing power outputs of a lot of these batteries. But, you know, 
I, I'm really impressed with this new 5P battery from Enphase because when you start stacking these and now, and now you factor in surge power, like when you're trying to start AC systems or something, you're gonna be able to start an AC system with a lot less battery capacity. Now, of course, it may run out faster if you have you know, a, a lot of power but not a lot of capacity, but like I said, you can stack these as much as you want, and currently I'm actually working on um, a system that has eight of these 5P batteries stacked, which is gonna have 40 kilowatt hours of capacity. Now, moving over to degradation, most of these batteries are going to be very, very similar in terms of degradation. Most of them are around 30% at year 10, but there are a couple of batteries that slightly shine a, a little bit better in this category. The first one being the Enphase 5P. Now it says 60%, but that's at year 15. And so if you dial it back to the 10th year, you're actually a few percent better than 70%. And another one to look at is the Panasonic Evervolt, uh, because this is 70% at year 12. So you're gonna get a few more years out of it before it drops down you know, to less than 70% capacity. Every other battery pretty much is pretty similar and there's not really like some drastic winner except for the Canadian Solar EP Cube. Um, on paper, they say that they're gonna warranty up to 80% at year 10, which it, that's, that's actually pretty amazing um, if, if it's possible. One thing to keep in mind though is that a lot of these manufacturers, you know, these are relatively new products. The batteries are more, um, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of R&D going on the last, you know, five years for these. And a lot of these batteries are kind of newer in the market and none of these have been up on walls for, you know, in houses for more than just a couple of years. And so a lot of these batteries may have less degradation than what they say on paper. Um, it's just the, you know, the manufacturers not wanting to have to be responsible to replace the battery for free. And so I, in reality, I think you're gonna be getting more than you know, like a 30% drop over a 10 year period with most of these batteries. So, but like I said, most of them are relatively similar and there's not really one battery that's clearly significantly way better. You know, maybe the EP cube in this regard, but, um, it's more of a niche product. There's not as many contractors getting behind it right now. So it, we'll, we'll see how the support network really ends up being with, with the Canadian Solar. Um, okay, so AC or DC coupled. Now this is going to be one of the most controversial and I would say like religious <laughs> Um, con you know, things that, you know, they're, the, the people in the industry get very one-sided when it comes to what they think is better. Now, if you've been following my videos for a really long time, you 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 know that I'm very pro Enphase, which is uh, they they offer a micro inverting solution, and I have more videos that are going to explain this in detail if you want to go back and look at those. But basically, with the AC coupling, what that means is ultimately the battery is going to have to convert the power back to DC in order to store it because it's already been converted to AC on the roof. And so, you know, a lot of people will say there's too many conversions and there's too much power loss. And it's it's a somewhat valid point if you need a system with with the, the most efficient, you know, setup because you don't want to lose any power during the, the multiple inversions. But here's the thing, if you go with like a DC coupled system, like a hybrid inverter, Centralized inverters are already notoriously unreliable. And when you have a hybrid inverter, now that inverter even has more stress you know, on it. It's gonna be inverting even more power and even doing more because now it has a battery to manage as well. And so, you know, like Solar Edge, for example, we're replacing so many Solar Edge inverters all the time. And if that one inverter fails, the whole system is down. You don't have any power, no battery at all. And so for me personally, I am not that worried and concerned about having maybe a few percent extra loss because you can solve this problem by just slapping one more panel up on your roof and now you have the same amount of power and you have a way more resilient system because you have the risk diversified amongst all of your microinverters where if one microinverter has a problem, it only takes that one panel out. And also with the Enphase batteries, they have microinverters built into the batteries and so if one microinverter has an issue in the battery, then the battery is still functioning because you still have multiple other microinverters that are handling it. And so this is the, the only battery that has more than just one inverter built in. And so it does cost a little bit more, but in my opinion, there is nothing on the market that's gonna come close to this in terms of the reliability of that inverter itself. 
All right, and moving over to chemistry, LFP is lithium iron phosphate. That's gonna be the newer technology. It's safer. Most of the fire stations in the building divisions are changing their code and they're trying to make the NMC batteries not allowed anymore because there's thermal runaway and like theoretically, if it were in your garage and you had a car like hit the battery on accident, it could, you know, basically a fire could start way easier where with an LFP battery, you could basically take a knife and stab the thing pretty much and it, it's not gonna, not going to start a fire and so these nmc batteries are for the most part going out like the tesla powerwall 2 for example is an nmc battery and they're phasing this out the, the tesla powerwall 2 has been out for like four or five years now and you can notice that the tesla powerwall 3 which is coming out next year is lfp so they're improving and getting up to date with the modern chemistry but something important to understand is that the powerwall 3 is not a replacement to the Powerwall 2. The Powerwall 2 is an AC coupled battery which can be like put on systems after the fact. And a Powerwall 3 is gonna be a straight DC connection which is not really going to be compatible with like a microinverting system or something like that. And so it's not going to be for retrofitting. It's a brand new product for new installs. That's gonna be the main use case for it is brand new installs, not like retrofitting batteries after the fact. Now the round trip efficiency is going back to more the AC or DC coupled. You'll notice that all the batteries that are DC coupled, they're gonna have a higher efficiency and that's because the power is not being inverted a couple of extra times. Um, now, like I said, I just made my argument for why I don't think this is a very big deal, but yes, in theory, if you are wanting to have the most efficient system on paper, if it's working correctly, of course, um, a DC system may slightly, slightly on paper be a little bit more efficient. Um, like I said, I, I think this is an, an overrated stat. And I also think that something to know is that the market in late 2023 is on a national level, interest, you know, interest rates have gone up a lot and there's not as much solar being sold right now because most people they're going solar with loans. And now that loans are literally eight, nine, 10% for solar before you start buying the rate down, uh, which I have a whole nother video on. If you wanna go watch my financing video, I, I talk about loans and buying rates down, but if you're not buying it down and you're financing similar to the cash price, the interest rates are like eight, nine, 10% right now. And that, that truly is like as good as it gets. And so a lot of solar salespeople, they are trying to bring the price point down as much as possible. And to me, I think this is a very short-sighted um, way to think about it because yeah, maybe they'll, they'll get a little bit of a lower payment or make your system cost a couple grand less, but these, this is not like even a car that you're gonna drive for like, you know, three to seven years and then flip it or, you know, get rid of it or something. This is a system that's gonna supposed to, to, to last for like 25, 30, and the panels are even gonna last longer than that in most cases. And so for me personally, I, I like to have a more long-term view and there's no reason to set yourself up to have like an inverter fail and you have to replace the whole thing in, in eight years or 10 years, you know, more headaches, less reliability. And if you're, if you're going solar to, you know, just save 2000 more dollars than what you could save. It's like, why bother with the cheap stuff when you're gonna save tons of money either way. And it's just a matter of paying slightly more for better proven reliability, which literally in the last seven years of selling solar, the, the end phase microinverters, I've replaced less than 10. And that's out of thousands and thousands of units. And most of them are that, that don't work are DOA or dead on arrival. I've actually never seen a microinverter fail outside of like being up on the roof for like two months. I, I, it just doesn't really happen. All right, now I'm gonna talk about the, the batteries uh, in detail, and I'm gonna talk about kind of the use cases for each one. Now, I already kind of covered the Enphase 5P, and like I said, I think this is ultimately gonna be the best battery on the market. One issue potentially is that some of these batteries have cabinets where you can put multiple units into one battery and stack them like in a, in like in a vertical stack, right? And it can take up less space. And this is the one downside of the 5P is that they need to go side by side. And this is running a little bit of an issue sometimes when there's not enough room on either side of the house near the electrical panel or in the garage, there's just not enough space. And so 
That, in my opinion, is the main downside of the 5P, but that's more of an installing problem to figure out, um, and the codes need to be updated, and so a lot of the building divisions aren't allowing anything less than three feet in between these batteries right now, but they are 9540A you know, certified, and so hopefully that's gonna shrink to like six inches with a lot of building divisions here pretty soon, um, which will help that problem. But that, in my opinion, and if you're gonna argue AC coupled isn't that efficient, is the main downside of the 5P, but I am still very, very pro Enphase and Enphase batteries moving forward. I just, I, I've had such good proven results with them over the last several years that until something comes to market and proves to be more reliable, it's gonna be hard for me to like push you to another product, to be honest with you. I, I'm just personally very pro Enphase. If you call me up and you want something else, I'll give it to you, sure. I have a lot of these options available, but if you want the best, most reliable, proven technology, I just really think that having microinverters diversify, diversifies the risk and is really gonna make you happy in the long run when this stuff just continues to work. So 5P is brand new. Now the 10T, of course it has a double cap the capacity, but this is the old generation. So you can still get the 10T, um, but um, it's gonna be a little bit of an older technology. The microinverters inside are not as powerful. And um, ultimately the, the big downside to this is there was a kind of a communication error. There was this device inside the battery called the Zigbee. And basically it was communicating the data from the battery wirelessly to um, the Envoy box, and which is kind of like the brain of the system. And unfortunately, like in, I wanna say like 5% of systems, this Zigbee was having connection issues. And so Enphase had to figure out a solution. And so they decided in the 5P to hardwire the communication. So. It, now it's gonna be much more like bulletproof in terms of reliability. So I, I think that that is the way to go. The 10T is a, still a good option if you're trying to save a few grand. But like I said, this is a system that is supposed to last for you know years and years and years. And so why set yourself up with something that is a few years older and has kind of a known issue? I, I don't necessarily think it's the best use of your money. All right, let's talk about the Tesla Powerwall 2. This is by far, the most popular battery in terms of how many units have actually been sold. You know, Tesla has, I give them credit for paving the way and they, they've done a lot of marketing and the Tesla Powerwall 2 is a, a pretty good battery actually. You know, I don't really think that it's a bad battery at all. It's just a little bit of an older battery and it's an NMC chemistry, which is kind of going out of style. And like I said, I, I think within the next couple of years, you're straight up not even gonna be allowed to install NMC batteries in a lot of places because the fire, you know, the fire stations and the building divisions work together and the firemen, they know that the NMC poses a more greater fire risk. And so I think these are kind of going out of style to be honest with you. And so the Tesla Powerwall 2 overall, I think it's a pretty good battery, but just know that you'd be investing in like five-year-old tech. So do you want to invest in five-year-old technology? Because if we look at like computers from five years ago, I mean, it's like, it looks ancient sometimes compared to what's available today. So I don't really think it's necessarily the best battery, but the cool thing about the Tesla Powerwall too is that it's inverter agnostics and it really works with almost any inverter, which, which is really great. So you can kind of slap the Powerwall 2 up on like an existing system and it'll work with most systems. So that, that's actually really great for compatibility. The Tesla Powerwall 3 though, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, it is not a replacement to the Tesla Powerwall 2. It is a completely different battery and it's only gonna be DC coupled, which means that you can't use microinverters with it and it's really gonna be used for brand new installations and, and that's really gonna be the, the bulk of it right there. Um, it's gonna be more difficult to come and install a DC system later on. It, it's a little more trickier and more expensive to do. So not a replacement to the Powerwall 2, Tesla is betting on DC coupling because Tesla is all about being as cheap as possible. Their um, goal in this, you know, in this whole energy transition is to bring energy, uh, renewable energy to as many people as possible. And that quite literally means being as cheap as possible. And so no extra components are gonna be needed. Like you, you can theoretically use this without even like power optimizers on your roof, which I don't really think is very smart because now you have like some production issues if they're shading or different azimuths that you're dealing with on your roof. But um, it is gonna be in theory less expensive. So if, if pricing is really 
the issue here, you, you may want to consider the, the Tesla batteries, but like I said, it may be a little bit more of a short-sighted uh, way to, to go about it. All right, this Panasonic Evervolt battery, I'm actually quite uh, excited about. Um, a few reasons why is because A, the degradation warranty is just a couple of percent better. It's a 70% at year 12 instead of year 10, but this battery is AC or DC coupled, so it's more agnostic in terms of you know which components it'll work with. And something that's pretty cool about this is none of the other batteries really offer a labor warranty, which is, you know, like the contractors call this a truck roll, you know, a truck roll cost. And Panasonic is actually giving a $500 truck roll to the contractor directly if they need to go out and you know work on your battery. And so this is really going to help if there's any potential issues down the, the line, you as the homeowner not be nickel and dimed by service calls. So uh, I am a Panasonic uh, certified installer. Uh, the company that I work with is down here in Southern California. And so I think this is a unique offering. Um, it's not actually out in the market yet, but it will be within the next couple of months. And so I think this is gonna be a really good cost-effective option. And it also has that stackability feature that I've been talking about. So you can get up to 18 kilowatt hours actually in one stack. Um, and so if you have limited space in your garage, um, I, I think that this is a really great option with a unique value proposition with that warranty. And another little secret is that Panasonic actually makes a lot of the Tesla batteries. And so they actually have the Panasonic set up in the Gigafactory. Uh, and so these are actually mostly Panasonic. Um, so they're the true kings that have been around for like over a hundred years. And so I think that this Panasonic battery is gonna start catching some momentum. And I haven't really heard a lot of contractors talking about it, but I think, I think this is gonna be a really, really strong option um, as they become available on the market. Now, Solar Edge. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people who watch me know that I kind of don't really like Solar Edge that much. And it's not that I don't like Solar Edge. I, I think that the technology and the theory behind, you know, power optimizers and DC coupling, it all sounds really great on paper. The problem is, is that still to this day, we are replacing tons and tons and tons of centralized Solar Edge inverters. Um, they say that in the last year, they've beefed up the internals to be automotive grade. Uh, and, and I'm sure that they are getting a little bit better in terms of reliability, but still we've already had to replace one of those new inverters with the automotive grade internals. And so you're running the risk of having that single point of failure, especially because this is a hybrid inverting system where there's just one inverter that's gonna be responsible for basically uh, inverting the power from the roof and before it goes to the electrical panel. And then again, um, transferring that power to the battery and then inverting it back when you need it. And so it's gonna be now even doing more work than it did before. And it, you know, it's like double the workload all of a sudden. And, and there's still, you know, um, being known as not the most reliable option. And so sure, it may cost a little bit less up front, but I still, like I said, I, I'm gonna emphasize this fact, like this is a system that really is supposed to last 25, 30 years, and maybe the batteries are gonna, you know, not be quite as, you know, long lasting with the degradation, but like the solar panels and everything, it, it, they're gonna last 25, 30 plus years. And so I just don't really see a reason to set yourself up with a product that out of the box is really only expected to last like 10 to 12 years. And quite literally, we've had to replace about a third of these um, that we've installed. So it's it's been a headache for a lot of installers. And if you compare like how many contractors in Southern California, even five years ago, supported Solar Edge versus Enphase versus now, it used to be that it was like a 50-50 split, but now it's like 80 to 85 or 90% of contractors are super pro Enphase. And it's because they They've experienced so many service calls over the last several years. And so what's interesting is even some of the PPA, uh, you know, lenders, like for example, Sonova, uh, you could, you, it used to be that you couldn't ever even get microinverters with a PPA. And now because the true statistics and the true service costs of these centralized systems adding up, you know, are, are re making them realize that it actually is less expensive for them to install the microinverters versus, you know, maybe replace that in, that inverter like three or four times over the course of the 25 year agreement. So that in itself, considering that they're, you know, the actuaries that are 
trying to figure out risk, you know, for all this stuff for, for lending. And even they're coming around to realizing that the microinverters are really, even though, like I said, a little bit more expensive up front, really not going to nickel and dime them down the road. And, and, and you're seeing a shift kind of slowly happen. So Solar Edge, it's, it's hard for me to like truly get behind them. If the statistics come out that, hey, their inverters aren't really failing anymore, then I will change my mind. But until that happens, it's gonna be hard for me to recommend them. Now, Sun Power, okay, I also am not the biggest fan of Sun Power, um, partly because their sales pitch is kind of manip a manipulative lie. They don't really even make anything anymore. And they actually use the Enphase microinverters inside of their panels. Um, but the thing is, if you're gonna go with a SunPower battery, it's only gonna be compatible with a SunPower system. So this, this is not a battery that you're ever gonna be like just looking at as a standalone. You're only gonna be getting SunPower battery with a SunPower system. And so also something to keep in mind is that with the IQ8 microinverters, which is the newest generation of Enphase, you have more like off-grid capability and it's, it, the relationship with the battery is a lot more high tech and allows you to like, for example, take power from the solar and the battery simultaneously versus like with the IQ7s, which the sun power systems are rebranding and putting in their panels. And so you don't have the latest tech if you're going with sun power, you're dealing with a five-year-old microinverter technology being paired with the battery. And so it's not quite as robust. They like to claim that they're the best, um, but there are some downsides to going with sun power. Now, as far as the battery goes, it looks fine, you know, on paper. It looks great. Um, I don't think there's anything really wrong with the sun power battery. It's just that you're dealing within the constraints of, you know, only being able to work with sun power and not being compatible with anything but, but that. And so for me, it's kind of a downside. And like I said, you're also dealing with the IQ7 version of the microinverters in their panels, which is old tech. So they like to say they're the best, but it's a lot of marketing going on. Also, you can see that a couple of the specs for SunPower are not here, and that's because it's very hard to actually find the information on SunPower. Um, I kind of like to think of them as like the Apple of solar, but like a dumbed down version, and they don't really want you to know all of the details. I mean, like I said, they go around telling everyone that they make everything under one roof, which is a complete lie. They just license and white label everyone else's products. They don't even make the panels anymore. So um, I tried to find and do a lot of research on the SunPower panel, and it was just really hard to actually find all the specs, because if you look at the spec sheets, half of the important things that you would want to know aren't even there. So um, you can look for yourself if you can find the pages, um, but here's a little example of what uh, I experienced when trying to research it. Now the Canadian Solar EP Cube looks really great on paper, and this is a battery that I'm pretty excited about. Now the Canadian Solar EP Cube is very, very good looking on paper, and I'm actually pretty excited to get a little bit more in depth with it. Something to keep in mind is that these batteries rely on contractor networks to actually service and install. You're not necessarily just gonna go to the manufacturer directly and they're gonna come and install this for you. It's gonna be another contractor that is servicing you know, the product and installing it for you. And if there's not a large network of people working with that company and installing that battery, it may be difficult to get it serviced in the future if there's just not a lot of contractors that are certified to work on it. And oddly enough, I'm not really hearing a lot of contractors even talk about this. I'm seeing most contractors kind of get in one of four boats and that's Enphase, uh, Tesla, uh, SolarEdge, or Franklin. And for whatever reason, these are the four that I think are kind of being backed by all the, the contractors. And so the Canadian Solar EP Cube, I, I think it's gonna be a good product. And I'm, like I said, I'm optimistic about it, but I just haven't seen very many contractors say, yeah, that's the battery that I'm actually gonna, you know, support and sell and and you know partner with so i think that's a little bit of interesting and i don't have very much insight to that in the moment um, maybe it was because you know canadian solar got in trouble for you know the um, trying to get out of tariffs you know back when they were importing um, panels um, through other countries to kind of bypass the american tariffs and so maybe a lot of companies are skeptical about that because you know they don't want a lawsuit or something uh, you know at, aimed at their manufacturer for example um, so more information will come as time goes on with Canadian Solar EP Cube. Um, now the Franklin Whole Home, I think that this is a very, very exciting product. Now, 
Um, a lot of contractors that really understand electrical and they're you know looking at the components, they think that this is a really high-end battery. And I, I've been very impressed with what I've seen so far. Um, in fact, one of the contractors that I work with down here in San Diego has installed two of these at his house so he could beta test them and make sure that he thoroughly you know knew how well they really worked on his own house before he went out and sold them. And so I'm pretty optimistic as well about the battery. It's LFP, it's AC coupled, you know, it's it's agnostic, it has good specs, good good surge power and everything. Um, something to think about though, you know, because I always want to play devil's advocate and I sell the Franklin battery and I have it if you would like it because it, it looks very good. But something to keep in mind is that it's a privately owned company and it's a Chinese battery, which nothing wrong with being a Chinese battery, but it's a privately owned company. And so if they don't execute fully and are successful with deploying their product to the American market, they could in theory disappear within a couple of years because they couldn't have figured it out. And it is a first generation product as well. Uh, and so some of the other batteries are more on the second or third generation. And so you may deal with some more unforeseen issues in the future uh, that we just haven't experienced yet because they haven't really been on in houses for very long yet. All right, guys, this was as fast as I could get through all this stuff. It was probably like 35 minutes. So if you're all the way at the end, reach out to me. I can help you out. 760-473-5878. I also have my, the, the link in the description is going to take you to my website where I have tons more information. And like I said, I cover about 30 states. So reach out to me, please, if you thought this was helpful. And I have a whole team of local experts as well in different areas of the United States that have local contractors and we can help you out, uh, like I said, as efficiently as possible and get you set up correctly, which is the most important thing because there's too many people that are going solar and their systems are not doing what they are, what the salesperson said that they were gonna do. And now they just have this bad view on solar altogether because it really came down to them not getting good advice at the beginning. So anyways, if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much and tune in for the next.